The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back, Bronx Roots, with David Hubler and Michael Preminger. How are you, Mike? I'm fine. I'm just. I'm just fine. It's. Uh, I shouldn't complain about the heat. Not that I am out here in California, in Los Angeles, compared. Well, I don't want to get serious with the fires going on. But uh, there was an article in today's paper. I think that. It's going to be getting warmer. So we will. Wow. Uh, I guess it, the whole world is getting warmer. If and the had, if, too, yeah. If you could say something to all the folk out there, if you had. Well, you can. You're a podcaster. Is there global warming? <laughs> or what? <laughs> Climate change? Anybody who who doubts it for any moment in the world has to shake themselves. Uh, yeah. David Hubler, where you are, has, has things changed? The last five years, has the weather pattern changed appreciably? Yes, I believe it has. Um, we are seeing more, uh, like, for example, July was wet the whole month of July. It just rained almost uh, constantly, and not just rain, but like torrential rains. Uh, my backyard, or in the, and even the front, uh, are like a swamp. You walk out there and you just sink into the into the ground. Oh, They're so over, uh, you know, over soaked. Um, we've had we've had uh, the town of Frederick, Maryland, uh, has been inundated with, by flooding. Uh, twice the main street stores have been destroyed. I mean, this flooding just comes straight down. Um, and you talk about uh, heavy rains. Uh, they were expecting a dam to burst in Lynchville, Virginia, uh, which is about a hundred miles south of us here. Um, and they were afraid because it was an earthenware dam. It was not like the kind of dam that you see, like Hoover Dam or. I guess that's what they're calling it now, a Grand Coulee. I never remember. But anyway, it's not made out of concrete. And they expected that if the dam burst, the town below would be inundated by 17 feet of water in a matter of minutes. So you talk about, and of course the winters too. Uh, the winters here are pretty well predicated on what if there's an El Nino or not. Um, and if there is, uh, we'd have a pretty mild winter. But we're not seeing very much snow anymore. It snowed once last year. Um, and uh, But they're cold. The winters will be cold. Frankly, I'd rather have cold weather than snowy weather, but that's just my own personal preference. Are we going to be able to develop the technology to keep up with this and save the planet? Or is... Um is it Doomsville, and it's just a matter of time? No, I think if these politicians would decide to do something, especially those from the right, um, the science is the science is there. Um, look at what the previous administration tried to do by curtailing uh, uh, air pollution and water pollution, and now they're turning it right back on its head. And that's what I can, I can't understand how a group of folks can condone that. Yeah, Is there checks and balances in this, this here country. Yeah, we've and not just about that. that. We've I... talked in the past. This guy's doing crazy things that mm, mm, uh, mm. somebody's got to say step the, in. The headline on, in today's L.A. Times is "Record Heat in California is No Fluke," experts warn. Right. Oh, and you know, they hit a record high in Portugal. Yes, it sounds like I'm, I'm setting up a joke, but it's not. They, uh, it was like 114 degrees. Or, or no, close. no, the 114 degrees was in Death Valley. The 120-something degrees was in Portugal. And they've never had temperatures like that before. I think that could be as hot as it's ever gotten on the planet. Yeah, it could very well be, because the last two to three years have been two to three of the hottest years in the last, what, five? And those are the hottest years recorded of all time. 
So, yeah, I mean... Uh, it said yeah. Palm Springs, it says in the paper in July, the average temperature was 97, was 97. Mm. That's the average. Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, great place to visit, though, in the winter. Yeah, during the summer. I never understood when I first came out here why people, it would be, you know, 90 and... People say, "Well, I'm, we're going to go to Palm Springs for the weekend." What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> because it's less crowded <laughs> than in the winter. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> if anybody's no listening traffic. from Palm Springs, I, there was a comedy club that I used to play. It's called the mm. Comedy Haven in Palm Springs, and um, I missed that place. So it was a regular gig. So. Palm mm. Springs, like I say, is, is is beautiful, has the mountain, the ambiance, but 112 degrees, forget that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Too hot. Too hot. Anyway, what do you guys want to talk about? Uh, oh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, uh, I... I um, <laughs> I don't know anything at, at the moment. Uh, my uh, my my family's going to Cooperstown this week. Oh, I there that. already. I wow. talk about all the wonderful times I had there, but I've never been there, so I have to make it up. Oh, go <laughs> ahead. Well, it was the first time I went. There, was, Honus Wagner was there. He was very old. <laughs> And he but said, he liked I have your this stuff. card. He, he said, you want you a card? He great stage. Hmm? He liked your stuff. He thought you had great stage. Oh, he, liked he did. Stuff. He did. He did. And he <laughs> said to me, he says, I have a card. Do you want it? It's, I said, no, nah, I don't know. I don't know where I put it or anything. What did I know? What did I know? He was going to sign it, too. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Funny, on yeah. a different show this morning. Yeah, I was going to take it. About the Hall of Fame. And, um, wow, it's a coincidence that you mention it. Uh, you had a great line. We were talking off stage. You can't be here next week, David, and um, you're going to a wedding. So Michael says, well, do you know anybody? <laughs> well, you're just going to a wedding. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm going to pick one out. They're always in the newspapers out there. You know, <laughs> you know it reminds me. When when I think I've told this story, when I was bar mitzvahed, well, first of all, I was bar mitzvahed. David would know the place easily. I, I was bar mitzvahed in a temple, but then but then the party was at Schweller's Delicatessen. Okay. And uh, remember that place, David? Of course. How, how can I forget it? So it was in the back room at Schweller's. Back room. It was. It was, and the room was uh, uh, t to go into the kitchen. There were doors to go into the kitchen from the deli side or from this side. And I remember getting up to give my little speech to say thank you. And all you could hear was pastrami, rye, two dogs, <laughs> and people are yelling. Uh, instructions while I was trying to give this heartfelt, warm speech. And, and, and all you got was, was deli instructions. But the idea when I said, is anyone you know at the wedding, I just remembered this kid's name. I think Robert Bursky. Does that name ring a bell? Or am I Dina Bursky. That was Robert Dina Bursky. Maybe. I don't know. I went to a, 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 a bar mitzvah. And to this kid's bar mitzvah. And then after the ceremony... After the ceremony, after the kid did his stuff, uh, a woman comes up to me and 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 pinches my cheek and says, "You were wonderful," and puts an envelope in my pocket. <laughs> I said, "Oh well, thank you very much. How nice to get money to come to somebody's bum." So I told my father, "I said, here's what we're going to do. Every Saturday we'll hit a couple of temples. You wait in the car." <laughs> and uh, 
I'll collect some money, you know, two, three envelopes uh, every place, and we'll we'll do okay. And we did that for a number of months. We actually uh, we bought a boathouse because of that. <laughs> it was, it was, so when I say anyone you know, I always figured there's a place in Long Island, Huntington Townhouse, and it was a wedding factory. Yes. I, there would be like five or six weddings going on at the same time. Do you really? Was, I remember going in the lobby and you saw brides running through the lobby. That's like true. In, in a comedy movie, and and uh, so I I used to think you could go into any one of those weddings when. And nobody would know who you are. Just say, I'm on the bride's side, I'm on the groom's side. Have a little something to eat. And right. then you go and so uh, Some cake. So that's yeah, what's going to be in Columbus. Yeah. Well, you know, that's true. Now, w there's another place on Long Island, um, which is, I believe, the place that we were married at. And it, too, is one of the a wedding fa It was Leonard's. Leonard's on Ah, Long okay. Island. Uh, they only had like two weddings going on at the same time, but uh, the, uh, the other place I know I, w I went to a friend's wedding out there once, and that's what it was like. I mean, there's several weddings that, now. Supposedly, and I don't know this for sure, but it probably sounds legit that these places were money laundering schemes from the, by the uh, the mafia. The mafia ran those places, and. Oh. They, yeah, and they catered to like Jewish weddings and bar mitzvah receptions. If you, you know, uh, sounds perfectly uh, feasible or be, probably absolutely. But I'll tell you, absolutely true. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Mike, you had a you had Meyer, a, Cantor Meyer Lansky was quite quite a <laughs> thing. Yes, right. Very yeah. <laughs> And you better say your Haftorah correctly, because otherwise you're going to be found in cement, cement boots. <laughs> hey, Rabbi, we'll make yeah, an offer you can't refuse. Ceremony, do you my take this woman? My kid can't learn this crap. Rabbi, <laughs> approve it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, that what an interesting... But, you know, you're right, Mike. I, I found the same thing is true. Um, we were at a function in D.C. at one of the hotels, and I forget which one. It doesn't matter. But um, I walked into another ballroom, and there was another function going on. And it was, you know, people started to talk to me, and I was talking to them, and then I left and I went back. And I, I realized that all you have to do is if you want to, if you're hungry enough and you want to go downtown, you go, you get, put a suit on or a shirt, a shirt and tie, and you go downtown, and what you do is, you, you get hold of one of those little plastic uh, badge holders, you know, with the little pin in the back that you, mm -hmm. but you don't put anything in it. You just go in, and you can go into one of these functions, and they say, oh, you lost your thing. Oh, yeah, I gotta get a new one. And then, <laughs> <laughs> it fell out, Great. and and so then uh, you can you can sit down and eat, and you know, you know and I've told that story. It's 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 you really people don't question you on these things unless it's a mafia run operation. Then you have a little mm. bit of a trouble. But it was hey, like you I know, saw you with the pastrami over there. Uh, yay! Know. Out, <laughs> yeah. Some guy with his nose half up to his ear. Nah, get it. <laughs> That's great. Just don't complain that the portions are too small. That's right. <laughs> don't complain about anything, as a matter of fact. Just no. Just on the safe side. Well, you just go to another ballroom. Yeah, <laughs> Find another meal. Yeah. Find another meal. What uh, keeps, who's calling me? So where's your wedding? Where are you going to a wedding? Columbus. Goodbye, Columbus. Columbus. So Hello, Columbus. Yes. Good, goodbye, mm -hmm. Columbus. Remember, you remember yes. that. <laughs> Hello, Columbus. Yeah. I, I, I happen Roth? to like that. Was scene. that Philip Roth who wrote yes. that book? Yes. That was his first yes. first novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Terrific mm -hmm. movie, too. Um, yeah. Really mm -hmm. well done about the, the new rich. Um, the, so Columbus uh, is a very interesting city. It's small enough that it has a lot of diversity, big in insurance 
uh, business, and it's also small enough that the communities around it are very, very, I'll use the Yiddish word, Hamish. There's a lot of, you know, a camaraderie, a lot of hello, hello kind of thing. Uh, we used to go out to Columbus, uh, the same friends whose daughter is getting married, and uh, for the 4th of July celebrations. Now, the 4th of July celebrations in Washington, of course, require you going downtown. No, not really, but you, there are lo- local f- things, but not like they do in Columbus where the whole town sort of comes out. And uh, I remember uh, one year um, they had a, a concert uh, they do the big they do the big celebration on the third of July because on the fourth all the local communities have these little local town parades and people go, put out food on their uh, on their uh, front lawn and coffee and stuff and they all sit around and everybody chats and you can go and there you can go from one to the other and actually get something to eat um, and uh, the, the the whole idea of it is very very. American Midwest, Norman Rockwellish. Uh, so one year uh, we, they had this a wonderful John Philip Sousa concert, uh, and the band leader was a Sousa expert and college professor, and he would dress up just like John Philip Sousa. And, you know, they would do the Washington Post March, and they would do it. And it was wonderful because it was such a wonderful sort of innocent kind of celebration. Uh, and, and you could walk down toward the river, and they would put on a, a, a fireworks display. But as the music was playing, the local radio stations were all attuned to this thing. So, you, so there were local radios. People had radios out all over the place, and you could listen to this concert. Um, it was just a tremendous, and you know, just a friendly kind of thing. Um, there are local local things like that here, but they're not so well synchronized. And of course, if you, now if you talk about changing times, to go into Washington for the Fourth of July celebration is truly onerous, because uh, it's you know you used to be able to just grab a spot on the mall and sit there, and and if you were up near the Capitol side, you could either hear a, a very good concert um, prior to the the sky darkening and the fireworks beginning. Um, but now you have to go through, there are special security gates. You can't just walk across onto the mall. Uh, oh, you have wow. to go through a special entrance. And, of course, they check your bags. And, they, you know, it's a real, real uh, uh, mishmash of things you have to do and can't do. And then you get to sit there. Now, I don't know if they've done this uh because uh, 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 I don't go near it, but I, I know that so many people have told me um, that they, I don't think they even have porta johns in there. Because I've been told that if you leave to find a bathroom, um, forget it. You can't. You're not going to get back in. Mm. So uh, yeah, it's just it's so it's so difficult to do. I mean, it should be a free, you know, uh, yeah, just a free, yeah, free, absolutely. You know, something that everybody can enjoy wherever they're sitting. Uh, I did get a back, n- in the back of your mind. You're thinking, well, they didn't put the security this in there for nothing. Something well, sure, it's a, ma- a major mass, you know, uh, gathering of people. Um, right. I, the last time I went, I'll tell you, the last time I went, a friend of mine uh, and his wife, his wife worked at, in the Pentagon, so they were able to get some passes. Now, there's an entrance to the Pentagon that most people don't see. It's on the side where there's a like a, a, a boat to go, and they call it the General's Entrance or the Admiral's Entrance, I forget. But it looks toward Washington, where most of the Pentagon sort of looks off into Arlington. Uh, this one is sort of a... I won't say it's private, but it's it's not all that, it's not well known to the public. Anyway, so we went there, and just and it was like an armed camp. It was after 9/11. It was, uh, and of course, if any place can put soldiers around the building, it's the Pentagon, right? So there were soldiers all over the place uh, with uh, semi-automatic weapons. I mean, it was like a, a hunter taking over a, a, a banana republic. Uh, the fireworks were fine, but the, the atmosphere, the atmosphere was so so constrained, like, you know, uh, we're the lucky ones. We're sitting here and we're being guarded by the U.S. Army. I mean, <laughs> it didn't have the feeling of a nice Fourth of July celebration. 
David, I've never asked you about this, and you mentioned the Pentagon. Can't help whenever I hear the word Pentagon, thinking, <coughs> excuse me, thinking of 9/11. What's your take on that? The plane that either crashed, didn't crash into it, the whole thing. Just well, I was talking to Alex Jones the other day, and he told me it's a hoax. <laughs> He says the building. He said the buildings are still there, uh, but they had David Copperfield figure out a way to make them look invisible. No, I'm kidding, of course. And in um, helped. Yeah, uh, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, it, it became a very personal thing to anybody who was in the D.C. area. Um, in fact, my the woman uh, who runs the uh, the dry cleaning establishment. Um, where I, I go, uh, was telling me that um, she heard, she had a break. There was no one in the store. She heard a break. She went outside to get a cigarette, and um, she heard this plane. And it was coming in right over Columbia Pike, which Columbia Pike, if you take it straight, if you could take it straight, it would take you right to the, into the Pentagon. Uh, it was coming right down Columbia Pike, and she said it was so low that you could almost see the people in the plane. And um, that was the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. Um, and other, uh, you know, and then, of course, uh, of course, New Yorkers, have, uh, uh, the traumatization of New Yorkers was just intense. And for anyone who was a New Yorker and still is considered, you know, at heart a New Yorker, it was a terrible, terrible day. And I remember we were watching it on television from our office in Arlington in, in the right near the Columbia Pike area, and um, I said to some of the people, you know, there were these young, young, every time I've worked for the last 30 years, everybody's been younger than I am. So I was saying to these youngsters, um, you know, this is your, this is your Kennedy assassination moment. You'll never forget where you were. The 9 I, we, we didn't call it 9-11 yet, but never, you will never forget where you were that day. And then, uh, because our, we were on a thoroughfare that leads into, uh, if you know, Key Bridge in Washington that takes you across into Georgetown and D D.C. Uh, this is the thoroughfare that runs right into the Key Bridge. Um, and we didn't leave. We stayed in the office um, because there was a stream of cars heading in one direction, heading west out, out of the district. And I'll never forget it. I mean, there was just... There was, I've never seen more traffic on this particular street. And of course, all heading away, away. It was almost like uh, one of these sort of Charles Adams cartoons, you know, from the New Yorker, this horror kind of thing. And, and I, I, you know, I, I've been to New York a couple of times. We've so not gone down to um, uh, the site. And I'm, I don't know if I could actually do it, frankly. Yeah, it's um, it's eerie, but on the other hand, the city came together as it does with any tragedy. Yes, yes. The night amazing. lights went out, all that stuff. It just it's almost a moratorium on things as they are, and the people come together makes you forever proud to be a New Yorker. Oh yeah, well, you know, the only thing that that, that uh, didn't turn out perfectly for that was that the Yankees lost the World Series that year. Had the, you know, that was that would have been because there was such an emotional feeling for anything New York. Yes. Um, that you had a feeling that these ball players, and then they, of course, they did have certain uh, commemorative events uh, leading up to uh, the World Series uh, with the Yankees and and, and Hey, uh, David, you're a cap guy, I know, and as am I. Wasn't it cool to see guys like Joe Torre with FDNY? Yeah, caps? yeah, and um, and the NYPD caps too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think they tried. They did very well in commemorating. You know, 
the uh, Major League Baseball has such stringent and, and arcane re- regulations as to what you could put on your uniform and your cap and what you mm-hmm. can't wear and things like that. So I was very glad to see uh, that they, you know, uh, loosened the restrictions for these sorts of things. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why today they have all these different. You've, you've noticed the different uniforms uh, for like um, uh, Fourth oh, of July. there are some teams that have like literally. Oh yeah, yeah, uniforms. for the holidays and stuff. Our, yeah, our, you know, uh, pink bats uh, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, what is it, Breast Awareness Month and. Yes, all yes. these things, yeah, and and the yeah. play shoes can now. Uh, you, there used to be uniform black shoes. You had to wear black uh, uh, spikes. Uh, now you look at some of the players; they've got white. White is sort of uh, mild compared to some of these multicolored shoes with names on it and things. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that had a, if that was an outgrowth of of the nine eleven phenomena, but I thought baseball did a very good job of of keeping the. The, keeping the, the the fact that it was a, a somber time, uh, and while while these youngsters were playing baseball, it's a game. You know. Well, it's a marketing thing. To, all these uniforms they sell. Oh, sure. Gift shops yeah. on the internet. And well, they we, raffle them off too they, uh, for charity, which is okay. You know, when they wear these special uh, uniforms on the Fourth of July or Armed Forces. But they make re- they make replica. Yeah, uh, sure, too, that sure. Buy that sure. Weren't, sure. You know, weren't game worn. Right. Then you could put your own name on it and what have you. So it's um, it's become it's become a major part of the income source. Oh, sure. The yeah. Caps the the you know the shirts. The well, I was in Cleveland. I went into the Indian store. And they had a special rack of autographed caps that the ball players, the Indians, had actually worn during a game. And I looked at it, and you could see the sweat band. <laughs> it was terrible. I mean, who in their right mind would buy something like that and put it on his head? <laughs> the birds that were selling them, yeah. Well, um, speaking of baseball, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys have discussed this many times, but I was with... Uh, yesterday, I'm always with, on Saturday mornings. I get together with a bunch of guys, and one of them asked, "What is OPBS, OBPS, whatever? What does that stand for?" And is that hitting plus slugging. It's on base percentage plus slugging. So plus slugging. it's not just the batting average, but if you walk a lot. You increase your on base. Well, isn't that on base percentage? And then there's on base plus slugging. Yes, on base percentage plus slugging is what they call OBS, and that's a great stat, both for for batters and for pitching. How well pitchers do against batters. So, um, how, in other words, more what batters now. averages against them? Um, the war, war, yeah, that's wins against replacement. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, I mean, yeah. it's crazy stuff. I know, I know. and some and, of the and how far the velocity experts of, of, disagree about the importance and um, of of some of them. So, yeah, no, I'll just go one step. Yeah, how far how is the best? How fast? Out yeah. of the park and right. the, the elevation and the angle. angle right. Launch, 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 uh, yeah, I mean it's crazy right. stuff. It's really crazy stuff. Yeah. But and I'll tell you, the one thing that remains consistent is the improvement of the defense, uh, outfield play, infield play, oh, first yeah. baseman making plays, scoops. Um, it's just become a much better game defensively. I agree. And also, uh, yeah, I mean, I know uh, George Case doesn't like the the, cur- the current modern game because it's all swing for defenses, swing for defenses, and yeah, uh, with yeah, the batting average. Yeah, yeah, with this thing. Yeah. Well, but it's I'll all tell you, the but... team beating that now, and it's the Oakland A's who are basically playing, get the guy over, bunt him, get him in scoring position, that type of thing. And Billy then, Ball. Billy yeah. Ball, the old-fashioned Billy Ball. Right, so, Billy Martin. 
But no, you're right. Your, go ahead. If kids right. are going to grow up thinking you have to hit a home run, and if you strike out, it's not so bad. That's what seems to be yeah. the, the norm now. Right. Exactly. Somewhat. Well, you remember it, the kids. It is kind of funny that Babe Ruth led the league in in homers and strikeouts, too. And, Did he? Uh, yeah. Yeah. A couple of times. Before. And mm-hmm. Mantle was struck out a lot. But DiMaggio had fewer strikeouts than he had. What was it? Fewer strikeouts uh, than, than home, home runs. runs. Than home runs. Yeah. And DiMaggio, I think, never hit 50 home runs in a season. And had fewer strikeouts than home runs. Can you imagine that? It's hard to believe anybody could do that. Striking out like 10 times a season. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and to say nothing about how complete games have changed and specialization oh, and relief pitching and well, it's a changing world, gentlemen. Yeah, George uh, George Case might might think it's you know that that's his bugaboo at the end. My bugaboo is it's so darn noisy in these ballparks now. Mm. It's just like going to a carnival. I mean. I can't stand all of those. I have a friend that won't even go anymore simply because if you go to a ballpark, look look above you if you're under under cover, and you'll see these uh, uh, speakers all over the place, all over the place, and the, the noise level is just tremendous. They should maybe be measuring the noise level rather than how many you know how many miles an hour a ball reaches a stand. It's just awful. so interesting because a friend of mine out here went to a Dodger game, and he said never again for the exact reason you're talking about, Dave. Mm-hmm. Every mm-hmm. second, somebody yep. on the on the organ or, or something is just oh, well, they're playing loud rock music. There's never yep. a moment where it's that's right. it's quiet. That's right. At least that's you're outdoors in an NBA game. I went to a war mm. game. Ago. Oh, that is true. Deafening, literally. That's got to be just like going to Ringling Brothers Circus in Madison Square Garden. I, can, I, yeah, I, I didn't I, ever I see can. that. I was over. Uh, I was in the menagerie watching the freak show. Yeah, that's another thing they don't have anymore. What? Whatever happened to those people? You know, they started <laughs> watching us. <laughs> that was that, I mean, I, family. We they'd have freaks. We'd have freaks over to watch us. That's how bad it was in my. <laughs> well, you're in Queens. That's where all the freaks was, grew up, anyway. Again, <laughs> at a show called Bronx Roots, I'm yeah. at the mercy of you guys. Yeah, both of you from the Bronx. But we've but given I, you honorary membership because I, I, I know the citizenship. thanks to Rose Niss, who yeah. gave you. If you go back in time, she was one of the people that gave you guys honorary membership when your family first moved to the Bronx. So, the, this? She, she, my grandmother, she was a tyrant. Oh. Rest in peace, Rose. She'd say, and literally she'd say, throw me down the stairs. And three guys would get up from the family. My slippers. <laughs> We'd all be disappointed. Dude. Nobody got to throw her down the stairs. She asked. We would have said. Richard Widmark would have done a good job of that. Oh, oh. Remember? Yeah. Yep. Well, I, oh, boy, was he evil. Well, I forget the name of the movie, but I, I can't forget the scene. Something or something. was... I don't know. But, boy, he threw that woman in her wheelchair right down the stairs. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think that was All right, guys. Terrific show again, as usual. Uh, we will be back, not next week. It's a wedding time for yes. David Hubler, but the week after. Right, right. See you guys then. Okay. Be well, okay. gentlemen. Thank you Take again care. for your company. Bye-bye. Well, you're very welcome. Bye. Stay safe.